Okay, summers, when I was a kid, my parents would inevitably ask, you want to go to the mountains or you want to go to the beach? I always wanted to go to the beach because at the beach, I would build these ramps out of sand, you know, so you could roll a tennis ball down them and they would, you know, run down this <laughs> beach to the surf. I would bury my buddy in the sand. I would build a giant sand castle. Frankly, it was a no-brainer for me. I preferred the beach. But I'm not the only one who likes to build things out of sand. I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. In this episode, the world in a grain, or many grains, of sand. When you break it down, you'll find that whatever you're breaking down is probably composed of sand. It's a fundamental component of the material used to construct modern cities, and without it, there'd be no silicon in Silicon Valley. And nowhere is the need for sand more pressing than in Louisiana, where the sediment-starved wetlands are disappearing. Can we replace the sand before the wetlands are gone? What's at stake as we go with, not against, the grain? It's true grit. You may not think about sand a whole lot, except when you're strolling that beach on a sunny day and it's burning the soles of your feet, but it may surprise you to learn that sand is more than the gritty ingredient of vacation locales. As an essential building material that makes modern life, and in some cases, life itself possible, sand may be invisible to us precisely because it's everywhere. Sand is is really kind of all over the world. It's actually the most abundant thing on the planet, believe it or not. We find it at the bottom of rivers, at the bottom of lakes, on beaches, and in places where rivers have flooded over their banks over the years, so floodplains and places like that. Like here on the Mississippi River, where the story of life is as much about the sand and mud as it is about the water that carries it. We'll visit the Mississippi and find out about the efforts to replenish the sediment, mainly sand, that is being lost to the sea. The sand at this river is not the only kind of sand, but all sand shares a common trait. Technically, the definition is just little hard bits of anything with a diameter of between 2 millimeters and 0. 0.0625 millimeters. So you have sand, uh, you know, that's made from crushed up shells. That's why you get, you know, in some Caribbean islands, they have those pink sand beaches or green sand beaches in Hawaii. Some of it's volcanic rock, which is where you get those black sand beaches. But most of it, about 70% of all sand grains in the world are quartz, silicon dioxide. And that's the stuff that we human beings are really using like crazy. We're not only using it like crazy, we're using it up. We're running out of sand, says journalist Vince Beiser. The demand for it as a building material has stripped shorelines around the world. Battles have broken out over it, as well as a black market run by sand pirates who extract and sell it illegally. It is the gritty reality of modern life. We use more of this natural resource than any other except water and air, says Mr. Beiser. The world in a grain, the story of sand and how it transforms civilization, is his book. Okay, but a sand shortage? We have the Sahara Desert, the Gobi, the Kalahari. How could there be a dearth of sand? How can we possibly be running out of it? Well, here's how. Basically, sand... Even though most of us barely ever take time to think about it, sand is the thing that our cities are made out of. I mean, if you just look around you right now or any of your listeners, you are probably sitting on a floor and surrounded by walls and covered with a roof that are made of concrete, right? And what is concrete? Concrete is nothing but sand and gravel that's been glued together with cement. So if you think about it, every building, every shopping mall and apartment block and office tower all over the world is made at least partly out of concrete, they're basically just huge piles of sand. And not only that, all the roads that connect all those buildings, all that concrete and asphalt roads, also made of sand that's been glued together, millions and millions of tons of it. The glass, the windows in those buildings, every piece of glass anywhere in the world is just sand that's been melted down. The silicon chips that power our computers and our cell phones, also made from sand. The bottom line is, we use more sand than 
anything else in the world. It's the most consumed natural resource after water and air. We use 50 billion tons of it every year. So yeah, there is a lot of it out there. But when you're talking about quantities that big, you know, ultimately it's a finite resource like anything else. And we are, in fact, starting to run out. Well, if I were to look at this from the standpoint of a materials scientist, uh, I might want to know, well, what is it about sand that makes it so useful? I mean, is it because it's, you know, comes in small packages? It's, you know, a fraction of a millimeter in size? Is it because it's hard stuff? I mean, what is it about sand? So here's the thing. So the first thing to know about sand is that not all of it is useful. People always think about, well, deserts. There's lots of sand in deserts. And that's true. But desert sand does not actually work for the number one thing we use sand for, and that's concrete making. Concrete making takes up more sand than all the other things we use sand for put together. And desert sand is too, the grains are shaped differently. They've been eroded by wind rather than water, like the sand you find at the bottom of rivers. And so the grains are too round and smooth to lock together. What makes quartz sand such a great building material in concrete is it's very hard, right? Quartz is a very hard material. The grains of quartz sand that you find, like I say, at the bottom of rivers and lakes and floodplains and so on, they're kind of angular. They've got lots of corners that make them lock together really nicely. So when you you put a bunch of them together and glue them with cement and water, they lock together like little tiny bricks to form an extremely hard substance, which is concrete. So used in that way, it's a cheap, easy to use, and very effective building material. And you can find the basic stuff for it, sand and gravel, pretty much everywhere in the world. I'm just trying to picture now our uh, ancestors of 100,000 years ago sitting around maybe on the beach of a river or the ocean or whatever, you know, running sand through their fingers. And somebody comes up and says, you know what, all the future cities, of course, you guys don't know what a city is, but, you know, all, all future cities are going to be made of this stuff. And they, they would look at you rather puzzled because, uh, you know, it doesn't seem so obvious when you look at sand as sand. Do you have any idea when uh, people started to mix up sand with cement to produce concrete? Well, I mean, we know, the only thing we know for sure is that it was a very long time ago. They've found uh, cement and sort of a very primitive kind of concrete that was used by the ancient Mayans in Central America um, and one or two other places. It's possible that the ancient Egyptians knew about it. But the Romans, they knew all about concrete. They built roads out of it. They built buildings out of it, ports. The Pantheon, which is still standing in Rome today, is built out of concrete that's still intact 2,000 years later. So the fascinating thing is the Romans figured out how to make concrete. They figured out the trick of making cement, that glue, and combining it with gravel and sand to make concrete. And then as the Roman Empire collapsed, that secret just sort of disappeared. The world literally just forgot how to do it. So from somewhere around the 4th century AD, right up until the 1800s, no new concrete structures were built. The Romans built a bunch of stuff out of concrete, and then we just absolutely stopped for about 1,500 years until the modern era begins with the Industrial Revolution. And that's when concrete really came into its own and and really kind of expanded out to take over the planet. What about sand as used in silicon chips? You mentioned some of these other uses for sand, and a silicon chip, of course, has silicon, but it doesn't have silicon dioxide. They're not silicon dioxide chips. Do they actually get the silicon out of sand? They actually do. Yeah, believe it or not. And here's one of my favorite little anecdotes that I learned about working on this book. Just about every silicon chip in the world could not have been made without the sand from one particular area in rural North Carolina. What is it? That sand is more amenable to being uh, turned into pure silicon uh, wafers? What's the deal? Yeah, it's a little trickier than that, but basically it's the purest quartz sand that's ever been found anywhere on Earth. And they don't actually use that sand to make the silicon chips. They use it to make what are called crucibles, basically these pots for melting down silicon. So the quartz that they dig out of this area called Spruce Pine, North Carolina... Like I say, it's the purest quartz ever found anywhere. And they use it. They also run it through a series of things. They put it through a blast furnace, and then they run it through a few chemical processes and turn it into 100% pure quartz from which they make these crucibles in which we melt down our silicon. Vince, 
I mean, when I think of mining for sand to begin with, I don't think of deep mining, people going deep underground to find sand, that they just go to some place where, you know, it's a kind of a sandy place. It's right on the surface. Uh, but is that where most of the sand is coming from, or do they do other things like, I don't know, make their own sand by crushing up rock? So some of it is. Some sand's really easy to get. It's really close to the surface. Some of it is not. Sometimes getting to that sand involves stripping away what the mining industry likes to call overburden, which is their lovely euphemism for, you know, fields, meadows, forests, crops, whatever is in between them and the and the sand or whatever they want. Um, we get a lot of sand from the water, and this is where we really run into problems, right? Because there's a lot of sand on the bottoms of rivers and lakes and even on the bottom of the ocean, and we get millions of tons of sand from those places. But that creates a lot of problems because... When you suction up a whole bunch of sand from the bottom of a river, it's a really easy, cheap way to get sand. But the problem is, number one, anything that was living on the bottom of that river, you've just pretty much annihilated. So it can really be catastrophic for those rivers' ecosystems. I've heard that there are such things as sand pirates. What are sand pirates? <laughs> it's true. There's the, There are sand pirates and there's what's called the sand mafia. It sounds funny, I know, but they're very serious criminal gangs, if you can believe this, who have taken over big chunks of the sand mining industry in dozens of countries all over the world. Basically, there's so much demand for sand. Why? Because cities are growing so fast, especially in the developing world in China, India, Indonesia, Nigeria. It's spawned a black market in sand. And so these gangs that control the sand trade they do what, what organized crime does anywhere. They pay off police. They pay off government officials to leave them alone. And if you really get in their way, they will kill you. It sounds crazy, but uh, if you think about it, you know, there's a lot of money at stake. And whenever there's a lot of money in a black market like that, you're going to have criminals. You're going to have violence. Uh, finally, Vince, uh, any suggestions about the future? I mean, you know, a lot of people would say, what, you know, thousands of years after the Romans built something with concrete, we're still building stuff out of sand and lime and whatever else. Uh, anything ever going to replace concrete? I don't really think so. I mean, there's a good reason why we use so much of it. It's a really great building material in a lot of ways. I mean, like I said, it's strong. It's easy to work with. It's cheap. It's durable. And for a world of 7 billion people heading towards 10 billion, I don't see anything we can replace it with. What we have to do is get smarter about how we're using it. We have to figure out a way to build our cities in ways that are more sustainable. I'm sure this is not news, but, you know, we all know we're running out of all kinds of things, right? We're running out of fresh water. We're cutting down too many trees, fishing too many fish out of the ocean. And now come to find out we're using too much sand. To me, that just says... These are all just symptoms, really, of the same problem, which is that we're just consuming too much. We're using up way too much of the planet's natural resources, and it can't continue. We've got to find a way to live our lives and build our cities in ways that just use less stuff. Vince Spizer, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Thanks for having me. It was great. Vince Spizer is a journalist and the author of The World in a Grain, the story of sand and how it transforms civilization. Well, another reason to like the gritty stuff, meet engineered sand. What we've done is we've taken just normal sand and we've coated it with this mineral called manganese oxide. Find out how that makes polluted water drinkable. Then, later in the show, a trip to the Louisiana coast, where engineers want to let the Mississippi River do what it does best, build land. It's True Grit on Big Picture Science. been talking in this episode of Big Picture Science about how essential sand is as a building material for modern cities. It's also the basis of the silicon chips in our electronics. And all that's in jeopardy because we're running out of the grainy stuff. But not everywhere. 
A prodigious producer of sand is helping to keep tropical beaches beautiful, at least. Seth, have you ever walked on a white sand beach in Hawaii or the Caribbean? I have. I have. (laughs) I enjoyed it. Okay, try to remember that feeling of sand between your toes while we find out where it comes from. I am Pupa Gilbert, and I'm a professor of physics in Madison, Wisconsin. Pupa, I understand you study parrotfish. That is absolutely true, yes. This particular fish is important, apparently, when it comes to beaches, and in particular, to white, sandy beaches. Why is that? That's exactly right. What the fish wants to do is to bite into the coral, coral skeleton, to eat the polyp and the algae and the bacteria that are on the surface of the coral skeleton. And then the coral skeleton for the fish is just detritus. It just doesn't want to eat that. So what it does is grind it all up and then excrete the remnants of the skeleton as sand. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, Am I understanding you correctly? What you're saying is this parrotfish eats coral. Well, it's really eating this stuff that's living on the coral, and then it excretes uh, the parts that it doesn't want to eat as sand out the back? Yes, that's exactly right. And you can take my word for it. Um, I know everything about poop. My name is Poopa, so I'm a world expert. Okay. Well, well, all right. Uh, I guess I'm a world expert on Seth. Okay. Well, parrotfish, I mean, describe what a parrotfish looks like. I mean, does it have feathers? Does it, can it imitate people speaking? What can it do? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's funny. No, absolutely not. It has a beak that's similar to that of a parrot, and that's why it's been termed a parrotfish. But it looks like a fish. You wouldn't know by looking at it that it has a beak, actually. It looks just like any other fish. But it's excreting sand. How much sand are we talking about? Because what I'm imagining here is that a little bit of poop comes out of a fish. I mean, a fish isn't such a big thing. So maybe you get, what, a teaspoonful of of sand uh, every day or two? I mean, how much sand are we talking about? Yeah, so every time it bites onto a coral skeleton, a little bit of sand comes out, much less than a teaspoon. But it does that all day long. And there are millions of fish all around the world. So, and they've been doing this for millions of years. And that's how tropical sand beaches are formed, ultimately. I I made a quickie calculation here while you're speaking. I figured that if you have a beach that's a couple of kilometers long and, you know, 100 meters wide or whatever. I mean, if, if you're talking a couple of hundred pounds of sand produced by parrotfish every year, I mean, it's going to take thousands of years for them to create enough sand for a beach. Yes, yes. Uh, a single pair of fish, if you, they come in all sorts of sizes and colors, but the biggest ones can be up to a meter long, up to a yard, and they can produce, in the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, one of the big ones can produce up to a ton of sand per year. So it's a considerable amount. But they have had millions a year, so, so they're not in a hurry, you know. And their ultimate goal is not to create beaches. <laughs> that's just a side effect. Their ultimate goal is to eat. I have to say, I think that's my ultimate goal, too. Okay, so, <laughs> but, but how does the sand, I mean, it's just dropping down to the bottom you know, of the ocean there. How does it ever get back onto the beach? I mean, are there other fish that are, you know, bringing it from the bottom of the ocean up and up onto the beach? No, actually, what happens is that the action of the waves brings the sand up to the beach, and that's where it accumulates. So it sounds like the kinds of beaches they're making are beaches that are kind of in the vicinity of some coral, right? I mean, like near a reef. I mean, Australia comes to mind. Where else? I mean, where can I find a parrotfish-produced beach? Oh, pretty much anywhere in the tropical regions. There are coral reefs, and that's where you can find parrotfish, and therefore white sand beaches. The easy way to tell is when the beach is white, Most likely it comes from coral skeletons, which means it ultimately passed through a parrot fish. The other thing is that it's coarse. It's not silky smooth at all. It's fairly gross as a sand. Yes, I guess it really is gross as a sand because it's made from fish poop. (laughs) It's been washed by the ocean and sterilized by the sun. (laughs) Okay. Poopa Gilbert, thanks so very much for speaking with us. My pleasure. Poopa Gilbert is a physicist at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. While the excretions of parrotfish help keep tropical beaches appealing, 
Another kind of sand is poised to transform urban areas. My name is Joe Charbonnet, and I am interested in sand because it can become a vehicle for life-changing materials. And I'm a science and policy associate at the Green Science Policy Institute in Berkeley, California. Engineers there have created a sand that makes drinking water from rain runoff, water that is currently wasted. The reason that we're not using this stormwater for practical reasons is that it picks up things like herbicides and pesticides, yard treatments, and sometimes even things like dog poop. And those sorts of things make it very undesirable to be used as a water supply. Currently, stormwater is wasted. I mean, we don't drink it. But Joe Charbonnet's team proposes a novel, low-cost solution to cleaning up stormwater, filter it through engineered sand, and turn it into drinking water. This process will give us a whole new source of potable water. Engineered sand is sand that's coated with manganese oxide, a compound that binds to herbicides and pesticides, and even to the endocrine-disrupting bisphenol A found in plastics. I'm proposing that we completely rethink the way we treat stormwater. And instead of treating it like pollution, we treat stormwater as a solution to the problem of limited water. And instead of saying this is something to get rid of, we say this is something to hold on to. We can be adding this to our local drinking water supplies. Okay, so solution, not pollution, the catchy phrase. And that solution is sitting here on your desk. Yeah, we have some of the solution right here. So you can, you can hear it. I can pour some out for you here. Okay, so you're pouring this into my hand. Black, very, very finely grained sand. Yes. So what we've done is we've taken just normal sand and we've coated it with this mineral called manganese oxide. Now, you may not have heard of manganese oxide, but I guarantee there's some stuck to the sole of your shoe right now because it is a very common component of dirt. And manganese oxide has these really interesting properties where it can actually react with and destroy some of the very same contaminants that we see in stormwater. I'll have to dump some of it on this paper here. It's... It's very fine. It's left what looks like charcoal all over my hands. And, and I will say, so I ran to my lab and picked some of this up, and they had just synthesized it without sieving it. So in the end, it won't have that residue. It'll leave behind that powdery stuff is just because they hadn't sieved it yet. So is that manganese oxide all over my hand? Yes, that's manganese oxide all over your hand. <laughs> but this is the key to this engineered sand. Describe how it traps harmful chemicals. Yeah, so it actually doesn't trap the chemicals at all. It's not like an absorptive process like people might be familiar with with Brita filters or something like that. It actually reacts with the contaminant. It undergoes a chemical reaction and it turns the pollutants into something that's not harmful, which is really incredible. Yeah, so one thing that's really interesting about manganese oxide is that it's actually non-toxic. It's a naturally occurring mineral. And so You'll notice when you look at this sand that it doesn't look that different from normal sand besides being black. This looks just like the sand that cities are already using to infiltrate their water through as they store it in these underground aquifers. It's just coated with this mineral that's totally non-toxic, totally safe, and has these incredible properties. So it's something that utilities and interested cities could easily switch over to without disrupting their process, without adding a lot of cost. And how is this an improvement on the system that we have now? Right now, we are not targeting the kinds of herbicides and pesticides, things like bisphenol A. We don't really target removing them in our drinking water systems. That is the main purpose of this engineered sand, and it can remove 100% of things like bisphenol A as it filters through. So it's really a big improvement on that, especially when we start using these kinds of infiltration systems as a way to intentionally augment our drinking water supplies, to add more water to these aquifers. When we start doing that on large scales, technology like this will really enable us to remove those contaminants on a large scale. Describe for us how manganese oxide destroys these chemicals. And I understand that you've received some insight from this process by spectroscopy. Absolutely, yeah. What's so interesting about this process and makes it very different from other treatment processes is that it actually reacts with the contaminants and destroys them by taking electrons away from them and rearranging them into new and different components. So we use this really cool technique called X-ray absorption spectroscopy, where you accelerate electrons around at 
basically the speed of light and bombard your sample with a really powerful beam of x-rays. And it's sort of like taking a stone and throwing it onto the surface of the water. It sends out waves. And if you can imagine buoys sitting on top of the surface of that pond, they would also bob up and down if you threw that stone hard enough and send out waves too. And you could look at all those waves crashing on the molecular beach, as it were, and back calculate where all the buoys are, where all the atoms are in these crystals. And through that, you watch the manganese oxide actually cycle siphon off electrons from some of these harmful chemicals? Exactly. So we can actually see how the mineral structure, how the arrangement of atoms changes as they suck away electrons from these contaminants and turn them into less harmful products. If you poured some storm water through your sand here, your engineered sand, could you drink what filters out at the other end? Yeah, so it's important to remember that this is not a process that would replace our drinking water treatment plants. It's just that our drinking water treatment plants are designed to remove mostly contaminants that make you sick, germs, pathogens that make you sick. And that's because most of our water right now comes from pristine mountain streams and snow melt. However, if we start looking at dirtier sources of water, like storm water, our drinking water treatment plants are not designed to remove those types of contaminants, but this engineered sand is. So this would allow us to remove those contaminants before then going to the drinking water treatment plant. All right, so you have this engineered sand. It's regular sand that's been treated with manganese oxide. You have this sand. Now describe for us where it will be used. I know uh, one idea is that you put it in a, in a recharge basin in some of these major cities. Exactly. So you could collect stormwater from across a city and recharge it into aquifers, into big underground lakes that store water. And so this technology might be familiar to many people that have maybe seen rain gardens along curb cuts in their neighborhood or in the parking lot of the local grocery store, but we're envisioning this at a much, much larger scale than that. Many, many acres collecting hundreds and thousands of gallons of water every year and really making a dent in a city's water portfolio. A significant amount of water could be collected in places like LA where they discharge most of their water and stop them from having to import water across long, long distances. How do you prevent the sand, the engineered sand, from being washed away like regular sand. Well, that's one of the great properties of sand is that by coating the manganese oxide onto the surface of the sand, it's a little bit of a larger particle, so it won't get washed away as it sits within the soil. The sand really provides a strong structure to hold on to so that the manganese oxide can do its work without being washed away. Now, I understand that you have been interested in sand for a long time, since about the sixth grade or so, is that right? Yeah, I actually got my start in science and engineering and fell in love with technology and development through a science project in sixth grade where I shook sand and saw the big sand come up to the top. And this is something called the Brazil nut effect. It explains why Brazil nuts are always at the top of a can of mixed nuts. And in short, why do the Brazil nuts end up at the top of a can? Well, it's interesting. The most basic reason is because the small things can sort of filter their way underneath the big things. But if you look more closely, there are all these different flows and currents that happen when you shake particles around. And it's something that you can dig deeper and deeper into. And that's one of the things that I've always loved about science and engineering is the more you study something, the more questions you get to ask and the more you understand and the more enlightening it can be. Okay, well, finally, you have some engineered sand here on your table. Maybe that's about a third cup of engineered sand. Uh, when will you scale up and when will this be tested in field sites? Yeah, so the answer is it's already being tested in field sites. And so while I just have a little bit here sitting on my desk, we have huge quantities of this, well, at least by our standards, large quantities, um, being tested at a field site in Sonoma County up in wine country and also down in Los Angeles County. So these are two very different areas with very different stormwater qualities, but we think that this engineered sand can help turn stormwater from pollution into a local water solution in both of these areas. So it's really exciting to work with these utilities and help them address their water needs. So you are the sand man turning pollution into a solution. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. Joe Charbonnet, thank you so much for talking to us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Joe Charbonnet is a science and policy associate at the Green Science Policy Institute in Berkeley, 
California. So uh, what was it like to uh, run your hands over that manganese oxide? (laughs) Well, it does feel like sand. It feels like regular sand. But the manganese oxide does leave a coating on your hand if you pick up the sand before the stuff has fully settled or soaked in or dried or whatever it is. So I did have this black residue. I don't know if you've ever taken apart a D-cell, taken apart a battery or something like that. You see all that black gooey stuff. There's a lot of manganese oxides in those batteries. And I think some of that, maybe that's manganese dioxide, but it's another oxide of manganese. So the really impressive thing here is that you could take water that normally just runs right out the sewers into the ocean or the who knows where it goes and recycle it back into the groundwater, the underground aquifers. And it isn't drinking water. He was clear about that. You don't just run the water through the engineered sand and then you can drink it. But you could put it into the aquifers and then send it to to your drinking water treatment plant. Yeah, right, exactly, exactly. In other words, it's taking a big chunk of water that might fall on your city as rain, uh, most of which just because we paved over the entire city, just most of it just goes into the drains and disappears, and it's a scheme to recapture that water, or at least a lot of it. Coming up, the world in a grain of Louisiana sand is a world of birds, mammals, alligators, and the humans that depend on the sediment deposits of the Mississippi River Delta. It's True Grit on Big Picture Science. We've been talking about how sand is the most used resource on the planet, other than air and water, but sand is also a building material for ecosystems. Few places demonstrate that more than the species-rich Louisiana Delta, where wetlands are disappearing. Plan to revive them is in the works, but can it outpace the rate at which sand is being lost to the sea? We'll hear about the plan to help rebuild the Mississippi River Delta, but first, let's find out how it was created beginning about 7,000 years ago. Molly takes us on the epic journey of a tiny grain of sand. Frenchman Street in New Orleans is a continuous stream of bodies in motion, but the movement of people in a city defined by its vibrancy is unfolding atop the Mississippi River Delta, a place also defined by relentless motion, but on a whole other scale. I'm Elizabeth Chamberlain. I'm a postdoc researcher at Vanderbilt University working on deltas and sand and sediment. The sediment in the Mississippi River comes primarily from the Great Plains, and there are several water sources that are contributing to the Mississippi River, but most of the sediment is coming from the Midwest. So you can thank Minnesota for the sand and mud, and Kansas and Missouri, in fact, all of the Great Plains. This sediment that I'm walking on has traveled a long way to extend lower Louisiana. The river drains about 40% of the continental United States. Most of the sediment, about 80%, is nutrient-rich mud, but about 20% is sand. And while the Mississippi River is famously mud, 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 it is sand that helps keep the sediment composite stable. It's the sand that sits on the bottom of the river. And that's the most important to us because uh, when you look at delta building in our coast, the heavier materials will build the most substantial land. That's how the river built our state. I'm Rudy Semino. I'm with the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority of Louisiana, and I'm an engineer manager. If I were to hold some of that sand in my hand, that sand that's on the bottom of the Mississippi River for most of its journey, what, it, what does it feel like? The sand would feel very similar to what you would see at a beach, very coarse grain. It's what we would consider beach quality sand. So imagine that you're a grain of sand in one of the Mississippi's notable tributaries, the Missouri River, polished to your present size and shape by the crushing grind of a retreating glacier 10,000 years ago. You're speeding down the Missouri River, and then the volume of water around you increases significantly and your course shifts. You've reached the confluence with the Mississippi. Now you're on a dedicated path south. 
But being sand and heavier, you're moving along the bottom and you're slower than the silt and clay in the water column above you. That grain of sand, most of the year is actually staying in one spot, generally speaking. However, when the river starts to move, when that flow cranks up, you'd see that sand mobilized. Southward you go with the river that defines the borders of Tennessee, Arkansas, and Mississippi. And the effect that you see here is in every bend, you see a sandbar. Those sandbars, when the river picks up its flow and picks up the sand, it'll move some of the sand from that sandbar downriver probably to the next sandbar, but it'll be replaced with sand from the previous sandbar. So as we like to say, it's a, it's a perpetual conveyor belt of sand. Now, back before the levees were built here in New Orleans and along the riverbanks further north, constricting the river, the end of your journey would have been to drop out into a growing delta plain as the water fanned out and slowed. Rivers tend to move with time. They're not static features in the landscape. And they tend to operate pretty efficiently under natural conditions to distribute sediment across the delta plain, either by what we call crevasses, by channels that would allow the sediment to leave the river and go into the floodplain, or by moving the river course itself, which we call avulsion. So by the whole river course switching and building land elsewhere. And so it went. Sediment piled and shifted and eroded for thousands of years as the land-building Mississippi River jumped here and there, as the writer John McPhee described it, frequently and radically changing course like a piano player playing with one hand. At the mouth of the river, fresh water mixes with salty ocean water to create brackish estuaries. And by definition, an estuary involves a riverine influence as well as an ocean influence. Louisiana has been traditionally some of the most vibrant wetlands, vibrant ecosystems in the entire world. Swamps and marshes, bays and bayous are defined by what kind of water they hold and what grows there. And the sediment allows plants to take root. Depending on the configuration, grasses and reeds seize hold in a marsh, shrubs and trees in a swamp, and they provide home for a diversity of wildlife, birds, fish, mammals, reptiles like alligators, plus multitude smaller organisms that support the food web. Coastal Louisianans make a living off the richness of the diversity of life on land and in the water. Wetlands and barrier islands also offer crucial protection from the winds and water surges of hurricanes. All of that is threatened because the wetlands are disappearing. They are both sinking under their own weight and being submerged due to rising seas, and not enough new land is replacing them. Coastal Louisiana was built by the Mississippi River. After the Great Flood of 1927 and the Flood Control Act of 1928, uh, the Mississippi River was levied, and it prevented new sediment from flowing out of the river into the wetlands, particularly into southeast Louisiana wetlands. And as a result, we're seeing that that shoreline is receding. It's moving back toward the land, and so it looks very different than even people who are living there remember it looking when they were younger. That's because being a grain of sand today, and not thousands of years ago or even a few hundreds of years ago, those levees will channel you past these land building opportunities, straight to the mouth of the river and deep into the Gulf of Mexico. Scientists call this wasted sediment. Louisiana has lost over 2,000 square miles of land. One of the talking point figures that we use is about a football field every 100 minutes. So using some of the more recent sea level rise predictions, we could lose that much and if not more doubled over the next hundred years if we don't do anything. Well, fortunately, something is being done about that. A restoration project, one begun by engineers, scientists, and environmentalists. So here's the problem again. The re-engineered river is dumping most of its sediment into the Gulf of Mexico, not onto the Delta. But maybe more of that sediment could be captured, stopped in its watery tracks with a diversion. That is, let some of the river escape into the wetlands through a deliberate break in one of the levees. Now, of course, you want to know beforehand if that's going to work, but a river system is very, very complex, and a computer model may not capture all of the phenomena that might occur. 
So the Louisiana State University Center for River Studies and strategic partners around the state have gone analog. They built a large-scale working model of the lower Mississippi River Delta, and Molly went to Baton Rouge to check it out. Here at the Louisiana State University Center for River Studies, we have a bird's eye view of the Mississippi River Delta. This physical model is 10,000 square feet, depicting the topography and water depth of the area. It's a working model. Pumps control the water and the sediment flow, and the model lets engineers replicate the flow, water levels, and sediment transport of the river. It simulates one year of the Mississippi River in an hour and allows them to simulate what would happen to the Mississippi River Delta over 50 years in a matter of days. So this model is 100 miles of lower Louisiana reduced 5,000 times in scale. We heard it's 10,000 square feet, so that's roughly the area of five tennis courts. And it has the river and everything that flows in or out of it, all the significant channels. Molly spoke with Rudy Simoneau, the engineer manager from the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority of Louisiana, who's using this physical model to simulate sediment diversion. You're looking at the lower 14,000 square miles of our coast, and I look at maps of coastal Louisiana every day. But this scares you to think how close even very populated areas of our coast are to the Gulf of Mexico. So what you see where water is is where water actually goes on our coast. So it shows you how flat our coast is and how tidally connected we are. When we fill this model, we don't take a hose and go fill each of those little lakes and bays. We only put the hose at one point, but it's all connected. Now this river model allows you to simulate different river management strategies. Can you give us an example of what it can do and help you design a course for protecting and saving the, the delta? Sure, so the primary goal of this model is to look at the sediment transport abilities. And when I say sediment, I mean bed load sand in this situation of the Mississippi River, the lower Mississippi River. This particular model looks at how well certain sediment diversions perform. So a sediment diversion is a man-made canal from the Mississippi River into the wetlands, and we have 14 of those on this model. And we're gonna actually run scenarios to test the performance of each of those diversions. And, and we're gonna do it in a controlled manner. Obviously, uh, we're not gonna take down all the levees. We're not gonna revert the river back to the way it was before the 20s. There's too much industry here. This is a working coast. There's too many people living here. So what a sediment diversion is, is striking a balance of letting these people work here, live here, let navigation exist, let oil and gas exist, while also reestablishing that natural process that built the coast that we live on. So water is going to start at that end and come flowing, and Correct. sediment will come at that exactly. end too. So that, that system that you see on the other end of the model, you see a slurry tank, you see a computer system with pumps. Uh, we're actually going to inject that sediment into the river. Now sediment diversion is one of many projects that scientists and engineers are employing on the coast in order to build it up again. Correct. They, they are the cornerstone. We have built bare islands actually using dredge sand from the river. We've built wetlands using dredge sand from the river. Those are great projects. They've been very productive. However, when you look at the future and when you look at some of the sea level rise uh, predictions, those projects will continue to sink and, and go underwater. Uh, what we need are projects that, that can keep up with the forces at play here, that can continue to perpetually build land. So the idea is straightforward. I mean, you remove sections of the levee and you let the Mississippi River do what it does best, build some more land. The engineers will first run their analog models straight, in other words, the river without any further changes. Then they'll do it again and again by opening a levee over here or over there and seeing what happens. But can land building keep ahead of land disappearance? Well, the current interest in sediment restoration prompted a study in 2018 by Elizabeth Chamberlain, who was then a PhD graduate student at Tulane University, to determine the maximum rate at which the Mississippi could deposit sediment. She's now a postdoctoral researcher in earth and environmental sciences at Vanderbilt. She looked at the delta as it once was. About a thousand years ago, the sediment came down a different course of the Mississippi River called the Lafourche Channel or the Lafourche Subdelta. And when the sediment hit the coastline at the time, it was deposited and it built out new land, causing the shoreline to push out into the ocean. From our study, we documented that that portion of land grew at rates of two to three square miles per year. When we started the work, we truly didn't know what kind of rates we were going to see for land growth. And it's really critical for understanding 
what the Delta's natural capability is to build land. But overall, what we're seeing is that land is being lost faster than it can naturally be built. So as we see sea level rise increase, and we're already not able to offset what's being lost, I think the reality is that we will see the coast shrink. So even if they removed all the levees, which they're not planning on doing, they would never be able to outpace the rate of land loss. Dr. Chamberlain noted that prior to human influence, the delta grew at about two to three square miles a year. But over the last century, the delta has been losing land at an average of about 15 to 20 square miles per year. Still, the engineers are not discouraged. I think coast-wide, it's a losing proposition. I think that our, our coast is just being attacked from too many sides, right? That doesn't mean that there aren't parts or regions of our coast that we can't restore. The sediment load that's carried in this river can restore parts of this coast substantially. So we have an opportunity to sustain and rebuild this part of our coast. By using the physical model in Baton Rouge to see how sediment moves under different scenarios, Engineers have learned that one of the most promising areas for sediment diversion is in an area of lower Louisiana called the Mid-Barataria Basin. So uh, we're in the Barataria Basin, and this project exists in the middle portion of the basin. So that's why it's Mid-Barataria. Can uh, you point it out on the map here, a model rather? Yeah, so as you progress down past New Orleans, you can see the first major outlet there is where the Mid-Barataria would be. Can you describe what happens at a diversion point? This hasn't happened yet. This is what's proposed, but the idea is that it's a very controlled, engineered opening up of the levee to let that sediment and water come through. Correct. So there is a levee there today. Uh, what we're going to do is actually remove a part of the Mississippi River levee, uh, which is a major engineering feat. Once we remove that part of the levee, we'll have to have a temporary wall in place to maintain the flood protection. And then behind that temporary wall, we're going to build a large gated structure, similar to what you'd see on a dam or a lock. Then once that structure is in place, we're going to remove that temporary wall, and then we'll have a structure that we can control, open and close when we want to, to let the sediment and water out into the basin. Behind that structure, we're going to dig a two and a half mile man-made canal from the river to the wetlands. And how much sediment do you think you can get to go through that opened up levee in the mid barataria diversion? It depends on what the river gives us, but we think over a 50-year analysis, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of tons of sediment can be diverted into these wetlands. And you can model sea level rise with this physical model. Correct, and uh, we will. So our analysis will be a 50-year period, and we will adjust sea level. We have a series of pumps and drains along the edges. We'll be able to raise sea level over time as we continue down our 50-year analysis. Now, the timing of when you open that levee is crucial, isn't it? Because you want a certain amount of flow to be going through there so that you can pick up those, those right. stubborn grains of sand. Yeah, so the structure itself has to be designed in a way to maintain a critical velocity to move that heavy sand. Just like the nozzle on your hose, if we don't design that structure in a certain way, we don't get the right velocity, the sediment won't make it all the way down a two and a half mile long channel. Once it gets to the wetlands, we let Mother Nature take over. Uh, we're not going to try to over-engineer that. We want the natural processes to take over right there. When we're running this model and we bring students up here, for lack of a better term, typical fifth graders, they were loud, they were walking through here. The minute we opened those gates, they got completely silent. And uh, they were all able to kind of see it and click, right? So that's the beauty of a model like this. There's real science being extracted from here. But I do think you kind of have an opportunity to have particularly younger kids visualize things that they may not see in a textbook or a computer model or even a presentation. So uh, the physical model is a very hands-on tool, and I do think it's second to none in explaining things. It doesn't need a lot of words, right? You see what the river's doing. And, and this is the land that they're inheriting. That's right. So the, the underlying goal of the center, the exhibits that you saw, are to inspire that next generation of, of engineers and scientists who can work to continue doing this. We need the knowledge base. This is not a short-term problem. Thanks to the gritty team that helps produce this show. Senior producer Gary Niederhoff, assistant producer Sarah Derwin, and operations manager Barbara Vance. A special thanks to Rudy Simoneau, the engineer manager for the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority in Baton Rouge, for showing us the river model at the Louisiana State University Center for River Studies. Photos of the model and links to the Louisiana Coastal Restoration Project 
are on our website, bigpicturescience.org. And thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life, including the formation of our solar system. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to an episode of Big Picture Science called True Grit. And if you want to hear more Big Picture Science, you'll find past episodes in our archive at that website, bigpicturescience.org. And if you never want to miss an episode, subscribe to Bye Bye Sci on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or Pandora. 